Micah 6, 1 through 5. The Lord's case against Israel. Listen to what the Lord says. Stand up, plead my case before the mountains. Let the hills hear what you have to say. Hear, you mountains, the Lord's accusation. Listen, you everlasting foundations of the earth, for the Lord has a case against his people. He is lodging a charge against Israel. My people, what have I done to you? How have I burdened you? Answer me. I brought you up out of Egypt and redeemed you from the land of slavery. I sent Moses to lead you, also Aaron and Miriam. My people, remember what Balak, king of Moab, plotted and what Balaam, son of Beor, answered. Remember your journey from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. So I recently discovered um, this prayer someone shared with me. It's called the Welcome Prayer. It was, it was composed by a monk. And I want you to, um, to listen to this. The prayer is, uh, Dear Jesus, welcome, welcome, welcome. I welcome everything that comes to me today, because I know it's for my healing. I welcome all thoughts, feelings, emotions, persons, situations, and conditions. I let go of my desire for power and control. I let go of my desire for affection, esteem, approval, and pleasure. I let go of my desire for survival and security. I let go of my desire to change any situation, condition, person, or even myself. I open myself to the love and presence of God. Amen. Amen. Somebody introduced me to this prayer, and I'm, I am learning to love it. It's, it's a way to receive from God his daily gifts, you know, trusting that anything that comes your way any day is, is for your blessing. It's for your healing. It's for you to become more and more like Jesus. And then the second half is really learning to surrender, right? Learning to let go of our hu- human desire, our sinful desire to to control, learning to let go of uh, seeking the approval of other people when we already have the approval of of God. You know, it's learning to rest in God, Uh, even letting go of our desire for security, but just to open ourselves to, to God, to his love, to his presence, to what God wants to do in our life. And the reason I wanted to share this prayer with you this morning is because I see so many similarities to Micah chapter 6. You know, there is that the desire to surrender, to surrender to the Savior, to trust in Him, to know that He has a plan and that His will and His ways are best. You know, Micah is teaching us about this amazing God who has delivered His people out of sheer grace, God's amazing grace. You know, he didn't deliver them because of their good behavior, but he, he rescued them. He's a God that, that saves. He's a God that redeems. He's a God that always acts righteously. And the invitation daily is to surrender to him. So I want to take a look at this text in a closer way. There's really two two scenes in this text. There's a courtroom and there's a classroom. So we're going to visit the courtroom and the classroom today as we dig into this. So verse one, listen to what the Lord says. Stand up, plead my case before the mountains. Let the hills hear what you have to say. Hear, you mountains, the Lord's accusation. Listen, you everlasting foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a case against his people. He is lodging a charge against Israel. So can you picture this? 
We're in a courtroom. And the Lord, the Lord has a case against Israel. You know, he's saying, stand up. You know, plead your case like a, like a lawyer. And then he's saying, you know, who's the jury? If we're picturing all this, you know, there's, a, there's the, the judges up there, the jury, the, the defendants. Who's the jury? The mountains. The mountains. I didn't get this at first. I'm like, what does it have to do with mountains? But then I saw everlasting foundations. And it started to make sense to me. And then I did read a couple commentaries, and they agreed. So that's good. I'm not preaching heresy. But the, um, the mountains. Who, who's been here longer than human beings? Mountains. Who, who ne- who's always watching? Who never sleeps? I mean, mountains. The hills, the trees, all these things that God has made. And they are, they're a pretty good witness. They've always been there. They're, they've seen what has gone on between God and his people. And so they are called to testify and they are mentioned. And what's the charge here? What's the, what's the case? Why is God upset at Israel? I mean, they're his beloved people. They're his children, but he's still upset at them. And that's natural. We can relate to that. But we see, we look above in chapter 5, and it's these, the same things that Micah has been talking about. The same things we've been learning week to week as we're making our way through Micah. We have to remember that these were 30 years of sermons that Micah preached, and they're all condensed into the chapters of of this book. There's just seven chapters. This this, This is Micah's greatest hits, and he keeps coming back to them again and again. In verse 14, chapter 5, verse 14, there's a mention um, of Asherah poles. And there was a little note in my Bible that says, you know, these were wooden symbols of the goddess of uh, Asherah. And so this, this is a way for the people of Israel to worship foreign gods, to worship the thing that they weren't supposed to worship. It's a way for Israel to, we can think of it as Israel's just hedging, hedging her bets, right? I mean, yeah, sure. We've got Yahweh over here. We know he's the God of everyone, but we'll just make sacrifices to these gods too, you know, just in case. It's kind of like they have, they have a woman on the side. You know, they're, they're idolaters. They're cheating on God. And so God is bringing it up to them. And think about this. If there is a court case between God and human beings, who's going to (laughs) win? Who's going to win? It doesn't matter if it's Israel back then, or it doesn't matter if it's us today. You know, I'm going to go with God in that situation. But it is. It is the same way today, because there was sinful people back then, and there's sinful people today, like you and me. And God hasn't given up on us. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You know, but think about the ways that we hedge our bets. You know, think about the ways that we look to things other than God for for meaning and significance. You know, sometimes we accuse God. God, how could you do this? How could you let me down in this way? You know, we're accusing him. We're trying to point the finger at him. But we're guilty with our own Asherah poles, with our own false gods. And if this was was a normal courtroom, the jury would reach its verdict, the mountain and the hills would be the witness, and the, the, the verdict would come back. Guilty. You guys are guilty. Yes, we are. We're guilty. I'm guilty. You're guilty. We've messed up. You know, we can't, we can't earn our way to heaven. We can't earn our way to the side of God. And the judge would say, you know, you're punished. You're punished eternally. And that's how it would go in a normal courtroom. One of my favorite phrases in the Bible, you see this a lot in Paul, you know, it kind of paints this bad picture. And then he writes, but God... But God, 
But God did this. God did that for you. God rescued you. God saved you out of sheer grace. So that's what we're, that's what we're dealing with here. You know, as the old saying goes, to err is human, we mess up, but to forgive is divine. To forgive is, is God's work. But it's not always the forgiveness that we think of. Sometimes we think forgiveness is cheap and easy, and God just kind of overlooks our sin and our idolatry. But how, how can he? How could God overlook it? Because if he did that, that wouldn't lead to our healing, like we've been talking about. That wouldn't lead to us becoming more and more like Jesus. That wouldn't lead to our sanctification. Someone has to absorb the cost of our sins. So here's what happens. The eternal and righteous judge comes down out of his seat. He leaves his mighty judge perch. And he goes to the bailiff and he says, I'll pay that. I'll pay that fine. Because I want my people to go free. And yet, the cost isn't just $100,000 or even a million dollars. The cost is his firstborn son. Only Jesus, who lived a perfect life, can come and pay our debt. And so God the Father sends God the Son to pay that debt, to forgive us from our sins, so that we don't have to live in shame or guilt anymore. And we don't have to uh, be wooed away from God by these false ideas of security or, or false gods. But Jesus did all that, and that's all that he's, that's, that's the good news. And that will really, that will change your life, no matter what you're going through, because it gives you hope. It gives you hope. And so, we we move, we remember, we sit in that, that courtroom and we hear the verdict of, you're free, you're free. And we surrender to the Savior, right? And then, we're, so we're saved, we're rescued, we're redeemed, our ransom is paid, and then we enter the school. <laughs> then we enter the school where we learn what it means to live a life of, of gratefulness and thankfulness. Not a life of despair, not a loss, not a life of bitterness or complaining, no matter our circumstance, even if things are not good. We learn to live a life of gratitude. So we move from guilt to grace and now to gratitude. And to this school, we follow our Savior and we see that in the text, too. So a key component of any classroom is the teacher. And the teacher, the Lord, begins with this question in Micah chapter 6, verse 3. What have I done to you? How have I burdened you? And then, like a, like a good parent or like a kind teacher, he begins to list the things that he's done. And he says, I delivered you from Egypt, from these terrible oppressors. Uh, we looked at that story of Exodus uh, late last year. But Jesus paid, paid the cost. He delivered them. And then he sent them incredible leaders like, like Moses and Aaron and Miriam. How, have, how has this wearied you, God says? You're acting like it's this bad thing, all this stuff that I've done. Somebody told me a long time ago, never look a gift horse in the mouth. And I'm not sure exactly what that means, but I think it means when somebody wants to give you something, don't ask a lot of questions. The people of Israel are looking the ultimate gift horse in the mouth, and they're taking his gifts for granted, and they're, they're turning what is a good thing into a problem. He saved Israel, he rescued them, he sent them the, these leaders. Aaron made these sacrifices on their behalf. Miriam wrote these wonderful worship songs for them. 
And then he shares one more reminder in this section. He says, My people, remember what Balak, king of Moab, plotted, and what Balaam, son of Beor, answered. Remember your journey from Shittim to Gilgal. Well, most of us maybe don't remember that journey. I didn't necessarily remember it. I had to look it up again. So let me refresh your memory, because this is important. This is God's word. This story is found in Numbers chapter 22. And Balak was a king, and he was afraid of Israel. So he sent messengers to summon Balaam. Balaam was a prophet. And he asked Balaam, curse Israel, curse them, because otherwise there's so many of them, and I'm going to be wiped out. So Balaam goes to God, and he asks him. And God says, there's no way I can curse these people. These people are blessed. They're my children. And he keeps, um, Balak keeps trying these things and it never, never works. They wouldn't be destroyed. So when these other kings tried to destroy Israel, God took care of that too. And he used any means necessary. Even when Balaam's donkey started talking, God used all these things. And what are they? Well, verse 5 tells us that they are the righteous acts of the Lord. The righteous acts of the Lord. The saving acts of the Lord. That he's the one who saves. You know, we see that. We see that in the book of Micah. We see that in the New Testament. And we see that today. That the Lord is the one who saves. The only thing that we have to do is stop fighting and let him save us. Surrender to the Savior. Let go and lay down your arms and let him do what he does. Let him save. So the invitation through the whole book of Micah is to surrender, to trust that he knows better than us, you know, especially the things that we don't understand. That we can just, we can trust, we can believe we can surrender. And you know, I, could, I can say all these things. I can urge you. I can warn you. I can cajole you with tears. I can do all these things. But my preaching professor said, you know, show. Show, don't tell. And I, I, wanted, uh, I wanted to uh, for someone to share a story, but that, that didn't work out. Now it's not the right timing for that. So, uh, you know, even yesterday, I had to write a new conclusion to this sermon. And I thought what was so interesting was the songs that we sang and even just the, um, the connection of that. And even in our Sunday school class, we talked about this. But when I think about, when I think about surrendering to the Savior, here's the image that comes to my mind. I think about how Jesus welcomed the little children. How he welcomed them. How he, he said to come to him. Be, because, you know, in a way, we're all, we're all little kids. <laughs> we're all little kids. And compared to God, <laughs> we are little kids. And, but life hits us. You know, our, our, our friends die or we lose a job, or there's a health scare. Whatever the situation is, we have two choices. We can either go it alone, or we can realize that God is there for us. And whatever your trial is, and if you're not in a trial right now, you will be soon, but whatever your trial is, use it to draw closer to Jesus. To become, to become like a little child because that's the only way we enter the kingdom of God anyways. To, to, to just go. Go to your Father in heaven and ask him to save you. Ask him to help you. Ask him who, to deliver you. A little kid doesn't try to solve their own problems. They just trust. They don't grit and claw and try to gut it out. But they just go and they ask for help. And just like little children came to Jesus and sat on his knee and were blessed, we go to Jesus and we get to fall into his arms. And we know 
We know that everything's going to be okay. Maybe not today. Maybe not next week. But ultimately, everything is going to be okay. Because God is in control of the universe. And he's bringing, he's bringing us into this world where the, the kingdom will never perish or spoil or fade. He's bringing us to this kingdom and this world that everything is new. And every tear will be wiped from our eyes. And if you want to be part of that kingdom, then surrender. Surrender. Trust. Believe. Give your life over to him today and each day. And in a few minutes, come to this table. Come to this table and receive the life of Jesus. Amen.